Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be in your house. There's no better place in the world to be. And Father, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you will speak to each heart, to each mind. Help us to pay heed to what you have to say to us. Help us to see our true condition. And through the power of your Spirit, to apply the remedies to repair that condition. We thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Today we are going to study part five of the message of the faithful and true witness to the Laodicean church. This will be the final presentation in this series. Being that it's been quite a while since uh, we've studied the first four messages, I would like to just review basically what we have covered in the previous presentations. We've been looking at the disease from which the church of Laodicea suffers. It's a deadly disease. It's a disease which, if not remedied, will lead to certain and absolute death. Now what is the problem with the church of Laodicea, our own Seventh-day Adventist church, with us individually, not speaking corporately, but individually here in the pews this morning? We found that the church of Laodicea does the right things for the wrong reasons or with the wrong motivation. She does everything to impress men and to impress God. In other words, it doesn't come naturally from the heart. It is actually an artificial system of works with the intention of impressing fellow believers and impressing God. You see, the problem with the Laodicean church is that the outside is good, but the inside is rotten and all wrong. You see, Laodicea has the form and the theory of the truth. Laodicea has the form of godliness, but there is no power that leads to that godliness. Laodicea has correct ritual, correct beliefs, but no power behind those beliefs and those rituals. The church of Laodicea has the same problem as the Pharisees had in the days of Christ. The Pharisee, like the rich young ruler, thought that he was a commandment keeper. He said, all of these commandments I have kept from my youth, what more do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, the one thing that you lack is that all of your commandment keeping has to come from your heart. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Show your love for the poor. And then you will have eternal or everlasting life. The problem of the Laodicean church is illustrated by the workers of the vineyard who went out to work at different hours of the day. When pay time came, those who worked more felt like they deserved more. It's illustrated by the condition of the older son in the story of the prodigal son who served his father with mercenary motives. He wanted to impress his father. He says, all of these years I have served you, and you have done nothing for me. It's illustrated by the story of the Pharisee and the publican. The publican beats his breast, and he says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Whereas the Pharisee says, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other men. All of my beliefs are right. All of my rituals are right. All of my practices are right. And thank you that I'm not like this miserable publican here. I fast twice a week. I keep the Sabbath. I pay my tithe. Selfishness. Lots of works, but done with the wrong reason. 
It's illustrated by the fig tree, full of leaves, ostentatious as to its piety, but devoid of fruit that comes from the nature of the tree. It's illustrated in Matthew chapter 23 where Jesus spoke of the Pharisees as whited sepulchers. He said outside you have this beautiful tombstone whitewashed, but inside you are filled, filled with bones and with rottenness. You see the outside does not square with the inside. The outside looks good. People come to church. They return their tithe. They keep the Sabbath. They practice health reform. Not that any of these things are wrong. We need to do them. But they have to be done with the right motivation. They have to come from a loving heart. They are not there to impress God, to impress our fellow human beings, to make us look good, to think that we can earn salvation. They need to flow naturally from a converted heart. You know we can understand the situation of Laodicea by going back and looking at what happened at Mount Sinai. You know when God revealed the Ten Commandments on tables of stone, Israel said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. How long did their commitment last? A few days, at most. You see, because they saw the Ten Commandments as a list of regulations to measure up to. God has these rules, and we do our utmost to live up to those rules. But without a change of heart, they could not live in harmony with the rules. That's why later on in the days of Jeremiah, God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Not like that covenant at Mount Sinai where the law was written on tables of stone and the people simple, simply thought that they should measure up. He says, I'm going to take that law which was on tables of stone and I'm going to write that law on their hearts and then they will naturally do what the law requires. Not because they're trying, but because they have the law which by the way is a reflection of God's character, they have God's character in their hearts. In other words, the problem with Laodicea is that she looks fine outside, but she's rotten inside. And as you look at the book of Revelation, you find that Laodicea and God have two totally and radically different perspectives. Laodicea thinks she's rich. She thinks she has 20-20 vision. She thinks she's luxuriously clothed. And she thinks that she's happy and joyful. But Jesus says that Laodicea is poor. Laodicea is blind. Laodicea is naked. Laodicea, even though she thinks she's happy, is miserable and wretched. Obviously, Laodicea is very severely self-deceived. Have you ever seen a naked person who you say, you're naked, go, go get dressed. Me naked? You're kidding. I'm not naked. Or a person who's poverty stricken, you say, you're poor. No, I'm not poor, I'm rich. Obviously, the Laodicean church, that's us, is very severely self-deceived into thinking she's rich, she's poor. She sees, she's blind, luxuriously clothed, naked, happy, miserable. How could you have two different perspectives such as this? Ellen White in volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 252, has this to say. The message of the true witness finds the people of God in a sad deception, yet honest in that deception. Did you catch that? The Laodicean message comes to a people who are sadly deceived, but they are honestly deceived. They actually think that they're okay. She continues saying, they know not that their condition is deplorable in the sight of God. How do you convince one to seek treatment if he doesn't feel that he's sick? 
That's the problem with the Laodicean church. Jesus says, you're sick. But Laodicea refuses to accept the idea that she's sick. And therefore, if you don't feel like you're sick, you're not going to seek for a remedy. Volume 4 of the Testimonies, page 87. Ellen White has said this, The only hope for the Laodiceans is a clear view of their standing before God and a knowledge of the nature of their disease. In other words, the first step for Laodicea is to see her true condition and to know what her disease is. And by the way, the disease is that self is in the heart and not Jesus. Everything she does is with selfish, mercenary motives. To look good, to be saved, to look better than others, to impress God. Not that all of those external things aren't important, because they are. The problem is that these activities and these beliefs and these rituals spring from a selfish heart. Now in Revelation 3, Jesus proposes to Laodicea three remedies for her condition. And I praise the Lord that the Lord doesn't only paint a bleak picture, He actually shows the church how the problem can be solved. Because some people use the message to the Laodicean church to beat up the church, particularly offshoots. You know, and actually, they're like the Pharisees, because they say, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like those who belong to the organized church. That's, that's a Pharisaic attitude, isn't it? Of course it is. Now what are the three remedies? Number one, gold tried in fire. Number two, white garments. By the way, the gold is to take care of the poverty. The white garments are to take care of the nakedness. And I salve to take care of the blindness. Now let's talk about each one of these remedies that God proposes to the church of Laodicea. What is the gold tried in fire? Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. And we're going to find what the gold tried in fire is. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. Here the Apostle Paul says this, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. What is it that avails then in Christ? But faith, which what? Which works by love. Does Laodicea have a lot of works? Yes, she does. Who produces those works? Laodicea herself. They are not works of faith. They are works of law that she produces. But notice that Galatians 5 verse 6 speaks about a faith that works. And what is the motivating principle that leads faith to work? Love. Notice how James describes this. James 1 verse 27. Here James says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. You want to know what true religion is? What undefiled religion is? Here's the definition. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You know, I would challenge the church. If you want a real blessing in your life, Talk to Pastor Jensen and go visit him. The shut-ins. The fatherless and the widows. You know, you will bring a blessing to them, but you will be the most blessed. Visit someone who's depressed, someone who's discouraged. Not because you have to, not because if I don't do it, 
the Lord's not going to allow me into heaven. No, when the love of Jesus is in the heart, it will be a delight to go out and do it. We'll do it with a smile on our face, with joy in our hearts, because we love people, not because we're forced to do it. And of course, the last part of the verse says, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, speaks about what the riches represent. It represents actually faith that works by love. But notice how the Apostle Paul am amplifies this idea. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verses 17 through 19. He says this, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. See, physical riches are uncertain riches. But to trust in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And now notice this, that they do good, that they be what? Rich in good works. What are the riches that Laodicea needs? Good works. Produced by what? By faith. A faith that loves. Are you catching the picture? What's the problem with Laodicea? Laodicea has a cold heart. And she's cold towards people. Because there's no love there. She says that they be rich in good works. And, and what, what is the result? Ready to distribute. It's to give. Willing to communicate. That is, speak the gospel. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Powerful passage. Rich in good works. You see, Laodicea doesn't have good works. The Sabbath keeping of Laodicea is not a good work, it's an evil work, because it's something she does because she thinks she's saved by doing it. You see, Laodicea's tithe returning is not really a good work, it's an evil work, because they do it in order to impress God and to be recognized. The health reform of Laodicea many times is a health reform where they do it in order to criticize the one who does not do it. Are you understanding the picture here? When the Apostle Paul talks about works of law, have you ever heard the expression works of law, man is not justified by works of law? Those works of law aren't good works at all. There are works that a person performs in order for God to save you. In other words, by definition, works of law are evil works because they're not works of faith. They don't spring from a loving heart. James 2 verse 5, continuing on what the riches are, says in James chapter 2 verse 5, Hearken, my brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in what? Rich in faith. What kind of faith? A faith that what? A faith that works, we noticed. Hath God, not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Now notice, which he hath promised to them that love him. What kind of works are these? They are works of what? Works of faith and love. We all know that passage in James chapter 2, beginning with verse 14. It's an, a vivid illustration of this, of these riches that Laodicea needs. Let's go through this passage quickly. James chapter 2, and beginning with verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man, now knows this, though a man say he hath faith, you catch that point? What does it profit if a man says he has faith and have not works? Can such a faith save him? Can a workless faith save you? 
Can a faithless work save you? That went over your head. Can a faithless work save you? Can faithless works save you? Can workless faith save you? No. It has to be a faith that works. An active faith. Can such a faith, can a workless faith save you? Verse 15. What is he talking about? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? What does it profit to come to church and to keep the Sabbath and to return your tithe and to practice the principles of health reform if people are in need and you don't do anything about it? Faith is not working by love, in other words. Verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is what? Is dead, being alone. Listen to what I'm going to say now. Man is saved by faith alone. But the faith that saves is never alone. I repeat, man is saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Because where faith appears, works appear. Works of love from the heart. Not works produced from a selfish heart. Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, I have works. And then he says, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Man is not saved by faith alone in the sense that I mentioned before. Man is not saved by works. Man is not saved by faith plus works. Man is saved by a faith that works. Because that is the only true, genuine faith. Verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So if you have only an intellectual faith, you're not better than the devil, is what James is saying. Because the devils believe that Jesus was born into this world, that Jesus died, that Jesus resurrected, that Jesus went to heaven, that Jesus is interceding, that Jesus is coming again. They believe it all, but it doesn't change their life. By the way, all of the Hebrew, he, heroes of Hebrews 11 are doing something. They're the heroes of faith, but they're doing. Moses, Moses leaves Egypt. Noah builds an ark. Abraham has sexual relations with Sarah, even though he's an old man. So you're talking about action. Enoch walked with God. See, faith is an action word. Faith is not something that happens in your brain. It's something that happens in your actions. It's an action word. Unfortunately, we've come to the idea that, that believe, which is the same word that is translated faith, is something that happens in our head. But that which goes into our head needs to be translated into action. Verse 20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Verse 21, Was not Abraham, now this, this threw Martin Luther for a loop. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar, you know, Martin Luther called uh, the book of James the epistle of straw. And in fact, he said more than once that if he had his way, he would take some scissors and cut it out of the New Testament. Because Paul says we're justified by faith without works of law. James says, was not our father Abraham justified by works? It all depends how you look at it. You see, Paul is telling us how is a lost person saved? James is telling us how a saved person should live. So Paul's focus is how is a person saved? By grace through faith. 
James is saying yes, but a true faith is a faith that what? That works. And if it doesn't work, it's not faith. And so God is saying that Laodicea needs to have lots of works, but produced by a faith that loves. Verse 22, seest thou how faith wrought or was working together with his works? And by works was faith made perfect? See, without works, faith is imperfect, incomplete. Let me ask you, what's more important, a bodiless spirit or a spiritless body? You can't have one without the other. And that's what James is saying. By the way, let me ask you this. When you open a door, which side of the door moves first? The inside or the outside? <laughs> huh? They both move together. That's faith and works. Where faith appears, works follow. When you came to church this morning, which wheels move first, the front wheels or the back wheels? Let's take a car that is back wheel drive, okay? What happens when the back wheels begin to roll? They, they push, don't they? They push. What happens with the front wheels? They follow. Faith, a, a loving faith is the power. But where there is the power, there is what? Works follow. Works of faith, works of love, not works of law. Let me ask you, which oar is more important, the right oar or the left oar of a rowboat? <laughs> which is more important? They're both indispensable. They have to work what? Together. Or else you're going to go in circles. Ellen White says that faith and works are like two oars of a rowboat. They need to work together. Or else you will have an unbalanced Christian life. Verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Isn't that marvelous? When his faith worked, he was called what? The friend of God. Verse 24, ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. See, Paul and James are not contradicting each other, folks. The Apostle Paul is fighting against those who say we are saved by faithless works. Whereas James is fighting against those who say that we are saved by a workless faith. In other words, both of them have to go together. And then in verse 25, we see likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works? When she, notice what she did, she acted on her faith, even though she knew that it might cost her her life because she was hiding spies and they were looking for them to kill them. She says, What's, uh, uh, the Bible says, was not she justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way? She, she acted. And then he reaches the conclusion by saying, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So Laodicea needs a new heart that through faith and love will produce works. And don't anybody say that Pastor Bohr is saying that, that we don't have to keep God's law anymore, we don't have to keep the Sabbath, we don't have to practice health reform, we don't have to tithe anymore. What I'm saying is that all of those things have to come for the right reason. Or else they're not acceptable in the sight of God. <laughs> Allow me to read you a statement from Ellen White on the gold tried in fire. This is Selected Messages, volume 1, page 398. This is what she says, grace is unmerited favor, and the believer is justified without any merit of his own, without any claim to offer God. He is justified through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who stands in the courts of heaven as the sinner's substitute and surety. 
But now comes the balancing statement. But while he is justified because of the merit of Christ, he is not free to work on righteousness. Faith works by love and purifies the soul. Faith buds and blossoms and bears a harvest of precious fruit. And this is the key portion where faith is good works appear. And then she, she explains what she means by good works. The sick are visited. The poor are cared for. The fatherless and the widows are not neglected. The naked are clothed. The destitute are fed. What are the works? Works of love, charity, to help people in need. She finishes by saying, Christ went about doing good, and when men are united with Him, they love the children of God, and meekness and truth guide their footsteps. That's the goal tried in fire that Laodicea needs. Desperately needs. As one of the remedies for her condition. The second remedy is white garments. What is represented by the white garments? Go with me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25. You remember when Adam and Eve were created? They were naked and they were not what? They were not ashamed. Do you know why they were not ashamed? Even though they were naked with regards to human garments, they were actually covered with what? With the glorious robe of light. Now there's a gr glorious white robe of light represented their state of innocence and purity and righteousness before they sinned. It says there that they were naked. They were both naked and they were not ashamed. But then Adam and Eve sinned. They lost their innocence. They lost their righteousness. What was the immediate result when they sinned? Suddenly they're naked. Well, they were naked before. But what happened? The glorious robe of light disappeared. And with all the light, now they look and they say, Oh, we're naked. So how, to, how did they try to resolve their problem? They, they implemented the Laodicean solution. It says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. How did they try to cover their unrighteousness? By making aprons of fig leaves and covering themselves. But you know what's interesting? Even after doing that, they still considered themselves naked. Does Laodicea feel, feel fully clothed? Does Laodicea feel fully clothed? Oh, yes. You, you mean you say, I'm, I'm not naked. I'm luxuriously clothed, is what Laodicea says. But God says, you're what? Naked. Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves. They said, that'll take, prob uh, take care of the problem of nakedness. But even after that, they're still naked. You say, how do we know that? Because in verse 10, this is after they put on the fig leaves... God comes to the garden and, and, and he talks to Adam and about Adam it says, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He wasn't naked anymore because he had fig leaves. Obviously the fig leaves do not cover the nakedness. By the way, the fig leaves represent their own what? their own excuses for their sin, their own works. Do you know what the greatest sign of a lack of repentance is passing the buck? When you pass the buck, you're not repentant. Oh, the devil made me do it. But my wife is like this. My son or my daughter are like this. The immediate result of the sin of Adam and Eve was to cast blame. They weren't repentant. They weren't sorry. they sorry they got caught. But they weren't sorry for their sin. They didn't realize what a, what a profound thing that they had done. 
And so when God comes and speaks to Adam, Adam says, the woman you gave me. See, if you hadn't given me that woman, a little while before, he was very thankful to have the woman. But now the woman you gave me. Her and you, you're to blame. And when he comes and he speaks to Eve, Eve says, the serpent you made. They're not sorry for their sin. They're sorry they got caught. They don't know the terrible consequences of their sin until they offer the first sacrifice. And they understand what sin is going to cost. Then their eyes are open. They no longer cover themselves with their own excuses and their own righteousness. Let me ask you, what was it that was going to cover the, cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve? Not their fig leaves, because they were still naked after putting on the fig leaves. Genesis 3 verse 21 has the answer. A profound statement. It says, unto Adam also and to his wife. Did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? You notice that skins is in plural? How many sinners were there? Two. And if you have skins, you have how many animals at least? Two. What do you need to do to get the skin of an animal? You have to kill the animal. What was God trying to teach through this ceremony? He was trying to say, Adam and Eve, you've sinned, and you've been stripped of the glory of God. You tried to cover up that nakedness of sin through your own efforts, through your own fig leaf garments, but that is going to still leave you naked. In order for your nakedness to be covered, Jesus says, I'm going to have to go to the world, and I'm going to have to suffer, I'm going to have to die, and as a result, my robe of perfect righteousness will cover you. Not your coverings, but mine. Isaiah 61 and verse 10 explains what the garment represents. It says there, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. And now notice this. Why? Why is it that Isaiah is saying, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Here he explains the reason. For he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of what? Of righteousness. Let me ask you, what kind of robe did the Pharisee use? He had the robe of self-righteousness. By all he did, he said, oh, look at me, I'm luxuriously dressed. God says, naked. By rejecting Christ, they could not be covered with the glorious robe of righteousness of Jesus. Notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. Galatians 3 and verse 27. It says, for as many of you have, as have been baptized into Christ have what? Have put on Christ. What does the garment represent? What does the robe represent? It means to put on whom? Christ. Do you know that even our greatest works and our best works are tainted by selfishness? It's very difficult to find anyone who performs a work that is totally altruistic. In other words, it has no self-interest. By the way, that's what agape means. It means giving without expecting anything in return. It means giving without having any mercenary motives. And when we do that, We've reached perfection, according to Scripture. Be ye therefore perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the previous verses speak about the love of God, His bountiful goodness towards the human race. The Pharisee, they were dressed with their own robe of righteousness, which in the sight of God was an abomination. That's why they thought their works were good. Notice Revelation 7, verses 13 and 14. How do we make our garments white? Is it by what we do, or is it by what, G by what Jesus has done? Notice, 
Revelation 7, 13 and 14. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Actually, it says in the Greek, those who have come out of the tribulation, the great one. This is the end time generation. And now notice what characterizes them. And have washed their robes. And made them what? Made them white. How? In the blood of the Lamb. The same Lamb that died in Genesis 3.21 or was represented by the Lamb of Genesis 3 verse 21. Folks, we can never do enough works to recommend ourselves to God. It's only based on the death of Jesus. But when we grasp what the death of Jesus means, it will be our delight to obey Him. Like Adam and Eve. Do you know, they tried to excuse their sin until God said, I want you to bring these two animals and I want you to slit their throat. And Adam takes the knife and he cuts the throat and the blood gushes out. Suddenly that animal is, is lifeless in the arms of Adam. Terrible! In a world where there was no death before. You know, today we're accustomed to death, so it's not so terrible. We see death every day. Every moment almost of every day. So death has lost its alarming nature. But in a world where there had been no death for Adam to take the life of those lambs. And then Jesus comes to Adam and he says, Adam, pretty terrible, isn't it? But that lamb represents me. That's the price of your sin. Do you think Adam looked at sin differently now? That it was going to take the life of his creator? Adam at that moment, his heart was regenerated. He was born again. He no longer tried to excuse sin. He saw the terrible nature of sin. And from that moment on, he said, I don't want to have anything more to do with sin. I hate sin. Look what it's going to do with my Jesus. So the victory over sin is not gained by looking at the law. It's gained by looking at Jesus. And when I see what sin costs Jesus, I will not want to continue sinning. And I will be covered with the robe of his righteousness. Romans 10 and verse 3 tells us what the problem of the Pharisee was. The Apostle Paul says, speaking about the Jews of his day and age, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness. See the problem? They didn't know God's righteousness. They wanted to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. There's a passage I want to read. It's quite extensive from the Spirit of Prophecy, Christ's Object Lessons, page 311 and 312, on the robe. Ellen White says this, This robe, woven in the loom of heaven, has in it not one thread of human devising. How many threads of human devising does the robe have? Not one! Because your works don't earn anything. See, your works flow from salvation. They do not earn salvation. They are the result of being saved, not the cause of being saved. She continues saying, Christ in His humanity wrought out a perfect character. And His, char and his character He offers to impart to us. So that His character is in place of mine. All our righteousness are as filthy rags. Everything, that, now notice, everything that we ourselves can do is defiled by sin. But the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. Sin is defined to be the transgression of the law. But Christ was obedient to every requirement of the law. He said of himself, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. When on earth, he said to his disciples, I have kept my Father's commandments. By, now notice this. By his perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. There's some people who say, oh, you can never keep the commandments of God. You can never keep the law of God this side of eternity. 
those who say that are limiting the power of God they're saying God isn't powerful enough and the excuse is well human nature is weak yes is it so weak that God can't do anything about it are you with me or not when you say that you can't overcome sin you're saying God isn't powerful enough to give you victory over sin you're limiting the power of God she continues saying by his perfect obedience he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments and then she gives a secret when we submit ourselves to Christ there's the key see we don't want to totally submit to Jesus we only want to give part when we submit ourselves to Christ the heart is united with his heart the will is merged with his will the mind becomes one with his mind the thoughts are brought into captivity to him we live his life it's not ours live out thy life within me goes the hymn this is what it means to be clothed with the garments of his righteousness then as the Lord looks upon us he sees not the fig leaf garment not the nakedness and deformity of sin but his own robe of righteousness which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah wow higher than any human thought uh, the highest human thought is what God has planned for his people God likeness not in the sense that Lucifer wanted to be like God but in the sense of being like God in character see Laodicea is self-righteous and it comes short of the righteousness of God that's our church let's go quickly to the ISAF do you know many times Jesus called the Pharisees blind notice Matthew chapter 15 and verse 14 Matthew chapter 15 and verse 14 Jesus says speaking about the religious leaders let them alone they be blind leaders of the blind and if the blind lead the blind both shall fall into the ditch what did Jesus call them blind leaders of the blind the Pharisees those self-righteous Pharisees who kept the Sabbath who practiced the principles of health who tithed who fasted twice a week whose life was was apparently a perfect model of piety Jesus says they're blind is that the same problem with Laodicea it most certainly is in fact in Matthew 23 five times Jesus calls the Pharisees blind guides fools and blind and blind Pharisee remember the story of the man who was born blind that's a marvelous parable I have a whole lesson that I wrote for the series on the parables on this story of John chapter 9 you see the Pharisees say they we see and they reject Jesus and so Jesus says you're blind whereas the blind man who was blind accepts Jesus and now he sees so blindness or seeing has to do with your relationship with whom with Jesus in fact in John chapter 9 in verse 39 we find these words and Jesus said for judgment I am come into this world that they which see not might see and they and that they which see might be made blind and everything has to do with whether you truly receive Jesus as your Savior or not whether you're spending time with him whether you're submitting your life to him without reservations whether you're investing your time your talents your strength your material resources putting it all on the altar of sacrifice not because we want to earn salvation but because we love Jesus the Apostle Paul was the typical Laodicean before his conversion he epitomizes the Laodicean did the Apostle Paul feel like he was miserable before he came to Christ? Oh no. Did he think he was blind? 
No, he said 2020. Did he feel like he was poor? He felt very rich, thank you. Let's allow him to describe it. Philippians chapter 3, verses 3 to 8. The Apostle Paul says, reminiscing about his experience, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. That means we don't have confidence in ourselves and what we do, our works, our greatness. And then he, he remembers his previous life. He says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Can you hear the Laodicean coming through? Rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. Oh, but then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. By the way, he was blinded and then his sight was opened because now he understands the gospel. Is there hope for the Laodicean? Yes, because Saul of Tarsus was one. There's hope if we can just see our condition and come before Jesus. The Apostle Paul then says, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the ex excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I'd like to read one statement in closing from the Spirit of Prophecy. This is found in Volume 4 of the Testimonies, page 88 and 89. She speaks here about the three remedies that we've spoken about. This is a summary statement. She says, The true witness counsels us to buy of him gold tried in fire, white raiment, and eye salve. The gold here recommended as having been tried in the fire is faith and love. Did we prove that biblically? We read several verses. It makes, now notice this, it makes the heart rich. For it has been purged until it is pure. And the more it is tested, the more brilliant is its luster. Where is the problem resolved? In the heart. She says the white raiment is purity of character. The righteousness of Christ imparted to the sinner. This is indeed a garment of heavenly texture that can be bought only of Christ for a life of willing obedience. Then she says, the eye salve is that wisdom and grace which enables us to discern between evil and the good and to detect sin under any guise. In other words, to detect sin and see ourselves as we really are. She says, God has given His church eyes which he requires them to anoint with wisdom that they may see clearly. But now notice this. But many would put out the eyes of the church if they could. For they would not have their deeds come to the light lest they should be reproved. The divine eye salve will impart clearness to the understanding. By the way, do you know what the eyes of the church really are? The gift of prophecy. That's the reason why prophets, before they were called prophets, were called seers. So the eyes of the church is the gift of prophecy, which means the spirit of prophecy. 
Why do so many people in the Adventist church dislike Ellen White? Oh, it's because she was a false prophet. Because she plagiarized. No, those are the excuses for not believing in God speaking through her. The real reason why people did not like prophets is because prophets told the truth. They told it like it is. They said you need to correct this. This needs to change. You need to detect sin. You have to see sin. And people want to hang on to their sins. They don't want to change. They want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to be saved in their sins. And I'll conclude with this folks. God gives a marvelous promise to those who overcome. The Laodicean condition. To he who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame and have sat down with my Father on his throne. What a glorious promise. To sit someday with Jesus on his throne. But in order for this to happen, we must first of all invite Jesus to come into our heart when he knocks at the door. I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. Big question is, are we going to let him in? How about we sing that little chorus, Into My Heart? Would you like to? Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in.